today the topic is icons. There's a lot we can say about iconography and images. Because our time is limited, I want to focus specifically on the question of, of Exodus 20, of the Ten Commandments, and what we read in there, and then how we make sense of what we do given Exodus 20, verses 4 and 5, which say, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, that's what a graven image is, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. That sounds pretty clear and pretty obvious. Do not make yourself any image of anything on heaven or of the earth. When we read the Bible, we are very holistic in our approach to the faith, and we are holistic in our approach to scriptures. So when we read any verse of the Bible, we need to take that verse and understand that verse, not just drawn out of the Bible, but within the context of what else we read in the scriptures. So when we read in Exodus 20 verses 4 and 5, do not make any images, okay, but what else can we learn about images in the scriptures? Not very uh, far beyond Exodus 20, five chapters later. So all of this is going on, by the way, on Mount Sinai. This is when Moses is on the mountain and God is giving him the Ten Commandments. But Moses spends 40 days on Mount Sinai. And most of the time is not spent with the Ten Commandments. Most of the time is spent with God giving Moses very detailed instructions about how he wants his people to worship him. Because ultimately, God wants his people to be a people who worship. And really what God is doing on Mount Sinai then with these instructions to Moses is he is restoring to his people their originally created purpose. Our originally created purpose is to worship God, to turn to him, to praise him, to thank him, to ask for his blessing upon all things. And of course, we didn't do that. We turned away from him. So much of what God tells Moses about his people is, this is how they need to come back to me as a people who worship me. So in addition to the Ten Commandments, one of the things that we have in the book of Exodus then on Mount Sinai is God giving Moses very detailed instructions about what his house of worship should look like. Now at this time, of course, the uh, Israelites are not in the promised land yet. They are, they're traveling to the promised land. And so the house of worship that they have needs to be portable. And this, of course, is the tabernacle. In his instructions for how he wants this tabernacle to be constructed and what ha what's supposed to be in it, we find a couple of things here. First of all, this is Exodus 25 verses 17 to 22. So again, this is still on Mount Sinai. This is still God talking to Moses. It's all part of the same encounter. So God says to Moses, so this is after he tells him to make the Ark of the Covenant. So he says, you make the Ark. And then he says, you shall make a mercy seat of pure gold. Two cubits and a half shall be its length and a cubit and a half its breadth. And you shall make two cherubim of gold of hammered work shall you make them on the two ends of the mercy seat. Make one cherub on one end and one cherub on the other end. Of one piece with the mercy seat shall you make the cherubim on its two ends. The cherubim shall spread out their wings above, overshadowing the mercy seat with their wings, their faces to one another. Toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be. And you shall put the mercy seat on the top of the ark, and the ark you shall put in the test, uh, put the testimony that I shall give you. There I will meet with you, and from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim that are on the ark of the testimony, I will speak with you about all that I will give you in commandment for the people of Israel. The mercy seat was the place of God's presence. This is the place where God literally was in the temple. And we note that what is on the mercy seat, it is two three-dimensional images of angels. 
So in Exodus 20, he says, don't make any images of anything on the earth or in heaven. Don't do that. And then in Exodus 25, he says, make these three-dimensional images of angels and put them on the mercy seat where I'm going to be. So it's not just do it, but I'm going to, from between them, I'm going to talk to you. So again, you see Exodus 20, you have to read this holistically. We can't take Exodus 24 to 5 outside of the scriptures and just form a conclusion or teachings on, based on that alone. You have to look at it within the wider context of what's in the scriptures. So that's the end of Exodus 25. He talks about the mercy seat and making images of two angels. Moreover, he says, Exodus 26, 1, you shall make the tabernacle with 10 curtains of fine twined linen and blue and purple and scarlet yarns. You shall make them with cherubim skillfully worked into them. In other words, you are going to embroider images of angels into these curtains that will then make the walls of, of the tabernacle. So again, Exodus 20, don't make any images. Exodus 25, make these three-dimensional images of angels. And Exodus 26, embroider images of angels that are going to be part of that, the walls of the tabernacle. Which is to say that when the Israelites walked into the tabernacle to worship, they were surrounded by images of angels. Again, you look at Exodus 20, verses 4 and 5, you need to say, okay, how does that reconcile with Exodus 25 and Exodus 26? And so what we understand is that we do not worship the images as gods. This is what we believe that, that God is speaking about in Exodus 20. It's creating an image and identifying the image as a deity, as a god. And we do not worship images as gods, but that it is completely appropriate, and even according to God's will, that we use images in the worship of the true and the living God. We know that this is how the early Christians understood this, because of archaeological discoveries of early Christian places of worship. Uh, one of them being the catacombs under Rome, which is where they would bury people, and the Christian catacombs are covered in, in images. And it's interesting because some of these catacombs, they're like, little, they're like little rooms, and they have a dome across the top, and on, on the top of the dome is, is a picture of Jesus. So just like in an Orthodox church today, at the top of our domes, there's an icon of Christ. That whole structure, that whole design, goes all the way back to the earliest centuries of Christianity in the catacombs. So the catacombs had images in them. But then also, they, there was this fascinating discovery that was made in eastern Syria. So there was a place called Dura Europus. And Dura Europus was a Roman garrison on the eastern side of the empire. And archeologists archeolo discovered a little a community there, a town there. And one of the things they discovered was a Christian house church. Now, when we think about house churches today, we, you could, we read about that in the New Testament, greet the church that greets in the house of this or the house of that. We tend to think about people getting, they all gathered together in someone's living room and they pulled out the ancient version of a guitar and played some folk songs and read the Bible and spread preached. But that's not what a house church was. House churches were actually wealthy Christians that donated their property to be used as churches. Now, one of the things they discovered when they got into this house church, when they were able to get, the, get it unearthed, was that the walls had images on them. A very clear example, just like the catacombs, of early Christians using images in their worship. Again, we do not worship images as gods, but we do use images in the worship of the true and the living God. The archaeologists also discovered something else in Adira Europus, they discovered a synagogue. That synagogue had even more images than the house church. The synagogue was covered in images. And this idea that you use images in the worship of the true and the living God was not even just a Christian innovation, but it's something that they got from Judaism.
Back to Exodus 20, no graven images clearly has to mean do not worship an image, but it does not mean do not use images in worship because for many centuries afterwards, in Judaism and then in Christianity, this was being done. Okay, so that's images. But we can go further than that. I had, a, I had somebody say to me, a Protestant friend that I was talking to, he said, well, okay, they decorated their churches and images fine. But that actually an image can actually do anything, that it can actually have any kind of power, that's out of the question. You can use an image as a decoration, but God does not confer his grace on people through images. Numbers 21, 4 to 9. Okay, the Israelites are going through the, through the desert to the promised land. And they're going through one of their grumpy phases. And then this is what we read. From, from Mount Hor they set out by the way of the, to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no food and no water. And we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. And they bit the people so that many of the people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. We have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord, bless you, pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And here's what God said to Moses. The Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. So again, Exodus 20, don't make any images of anything in heaven or on the earth. Numbers 21, make an image of a serpent. God telling him to do that. Not only that, put it up on this pole. And anybody that looks at that serpent, I will heal them. So through the serpent, God is giving them his healing grace. So that's a scriptural evidence of God conferring his grace through an image. Acts chapter 5, verses 14 and 16. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes, both of men and women, so that they even carried out sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on them. The people also gathered from the towns of Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. So at least the shadow of Peter would touch them. And what's a shadow? That's a pretty undetailed image of a person, right? So the shadow of Peter was able to heal people. Again, God conferring his grace through an image. And not just images, Acts 19.11. And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out. There's others, other things going on here. Second Kings, this is 20, verse 21. Elisha died, and they buried him. Now bands of Moabites used to invade the land in the spring of the year. And as a man was being buried, behold, a marauding band was seen, and the man was thrown into the grave of Elisha. And as soon as the man touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood on his feet. And this is why we revere relics of saints. Because we believe that the grace of God, that somebody who is a holy person, who is infused with the grace of God, that grace does not even leave them after they've died. That even their bones, that even their, their physical remains still are infused with the grace of God. And again, where do we get that from? We get that from the Bible. So Exodus 20 needs to be read within this larger context of what we read about images in the scriptures. Images that God instructs his people to make in order to worship him. Images that he instructs his people to make in order to heal them. And images and even the relics of saints and all these things through which God touches his people. This is not some kind of innovation. This was not something that somebody cooked up from paganism later on. But this is an essential belief of God's people all the way back to Israel, which begins on Mount Sinai, and the same place where God gives the Ten Commandments. 
So for us, it's not about worshiping an image. It's about using images in the worship of the true God, but understanding that if God so desires that even through those images, he can confer his grace upon us.